It's July. Welcome to the Teens Cornerstone Connections lesson. This month's theme is Back to the Future. With this wonderful lesson today, lesson number five, obedience is a good word. Music comes from the wonderful singer, Jewel, and Joyce will interpret every single word in sign language. Our mission story comes all the way from Costa Rica. Our panelists today are Silas, Sabira, Winston, and Andrew. Be blessed. Hello, my name is Amy, and I will be taking you through the mission story. Our story comes from Colombia, and we're going to be looking at Samuel, to the feet of Jesus. Samuel had a big dream when he was seven. He dreamed of leading many people to the feet of Jesus. He wanted many people to know Jesus and to love Jesus just like him. But he was afraid because he was only a small child. So he prayed, Lord, please help me to win at least one soul for you. He prayed and he prayed. He prayed the same prayer for four years. Then, when he was 11 years old, he and his family moved to a new city in Colombia. He thought excitedly, this may be my opportunity to win souls, he prayed. Lord, please help me. I want to win my first soul for you. At his Seventh-day Adventist school, Samuel quickly noticed that there were many children who did not come from Adventist families. One of the, those classmates was 14-year-old Johan. Samuel knew for sure that Johan was not an Advent, from an Adventist home because he had bad words when he spoke to other boys. Johan also didn't know the Bible when the teacher asked questions in class. Johan didn't seem to know any of the answers. Samuel thought to himself, Johan is my opportunity. Samuel started to talk to Johan about the Bible whenever they saw each other. They found out that Johan didn't own a Bible of his own. One day during worship time at school, Johan never leaned over and asked Samuel, may I read from your Bible? Of course. Samuel replied and handed over his children's picture Bible. Johan opened it up and began to read. Oh, this is interesting, he said. Samuel looked over to see what Johan was reading. He was reading Jesus' parable about the shepherd looking for the lost sheep in Luke 15. At the end of the worship service, the children were invited to pray with each other. Samuel prayed with Johan. Lord, please help Johan become a better boy, he prayed. Give him the chance to choose you. Johan liked the prayer. Thank you, he said when Samuel finished. He didn't pray. The next day, Samuel put two Bibles in his backpack when he went to school, one for himself and his new friend. The second Bible was a black Bible his father had given him for his ninth birthday. His chance to give the Bible to Johan came during recess. When Johan asked, can I read your Bible again? Samuel was so happy. He said, of course, you can read my Bible whenever you want. Reaching into his backpack, he took out the two Bibles and gave the black one to him. Then the two boys opened the Bibles and read a story. Afterward, Samuel prayed thanking God they could read together and asking for help in understanding what they had just read. After that, Samuel and Johan read the Bible every day at recess. Before long, Johan also wanted to pray when they finished reading his Bible. His first prayer was simple. Lord, I am here, he said. Help me. Thank you for my family. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to study. Help me to study well. Um, after reading the Bible together for two weeks, Samuel invited Johan to give his heart to Jesus in baptism. He agreed. Today, Johan is a new boy. Before, he used bad words and didn't know the Bible. Now, he only uses kind words and pure words, and he's getting to know the Bible and God very well. Samuel is happy that he could le lead Johan to Jesus' feet, and he is praying that they will be able to share Jesus with many more people. He said, it doesn't matter what age or the knowledge that you have, you can talk to people about Jesus. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help children learn about Jesus in Colombia. Thank you for planning a generous offering on September 28th. Sustaining grace 
surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us run the race not only for the prize, but as those who've gone before us, let us leave to those behind us a heritage of faithfulness for some Sabira Kundi, and welcome to today's panel, The Cornerstone Connections. Our title is, Obedience is a Good Word. Now we have seen the might of the Assyrian Empire that God used as a tool to punish his people, but they did turn from their wicked ways. Yet still again, they fell into sin, and as a result, God sent the Babylonian Empire. Now the Babylonian Empire took the Israelites into captivity and sent them to exile. But today we'll learn of very young men who stood for the Lord. Obedience is a good word. Ellen G. White says that obedience is the fruit of faith. Hopefully we do see that today in our lesson from the book of Daniel. I have wonderful panelists here. I'd ask them to introduce themselves starting from my far right. Um. Hi, everyone. My name is Winston, and I'm so glad to be here. Hi, my name is Silas. My name is Andrew Jabali. Thank you so much. These people before you are going to really explain, allow us to understand this story more in depth. But I think let's first dive into the what do you think section where Winston will lead us. Um, so on today's what do you think section, um, the question is, what do you think it means to be obedient to what God wants for your life? Um, so I'll read the choices and my fellow panelists will share their, their, their thoughts. So it means that I follow a bunch of rules and regulations to avoid punishment the second one, it means that I follow rules and regulations to earn salvation. The third one, 
It means that I live in harmony with the principles of God's law of love in response to the grace and love that God has given us. So we'll start with Jabali. What do you think? I think that Maybe as he continues to think, um, Subira, could you share? Absolutely. I think the very thirst, the third statement that you read, obedience, it means that I live in harmony with the principles of God's law of love in response to grace and the love and love that God has given us. So there's a verse in the Bible that says, if we love God, we will keep his commandments. Now, having harmony with God's law ensures that we sure, surely exercise our love for God. So I think, really, God's law and our obedience of that law creates this hedge of righteousness. God gives us the law to offer us protection, not to harm us, not to keep us from the joys of this world, because God himself is ultimate joy. What do you think, Silas? Okay, I think that uh, the third is the is the one that covers everything because God wants us to live in harmony with His principles and not just to struggle to follow a set of rules and regulations and seeming like it's a burden to us, which has a punishment at the end if you didn't follow. Yes. Um, so I'll also agree and go with the third response because actually to me that is what actually fully re responds to what obedience is because some of us actually maybe in school or maybe at home, we actually do what you're told to do to avoid punishment or rather not to face the consequences of not following the rules. But actually what obedience fully is is what we are told in the third place, that we actually need to recognize that what we are actually doing is what is best for us. And we need to follow it, uh, considering that God loves us, and we are returning the favor of his love back to him. Yeah. Thank you so much, Winston. And I think I'll even bring it back to our own parents. Andrew, when your mom tells you or your dad tells you to do something, when you're thinking of obeying them or actually going ahead with the action, what is motivating you to act, to actually obey what they're saying? What is motivating me? Um, I just do whatever they're telling me to do because in the Bible, God said that you should obey your parents and you'll live a long life if you obey your parents. Yes. Tell us, Silas, what is motivating you when you are trying to obey your parents or follow their actions? Uh, when uh, when I'm given a set of rules or guidance, I first I consider what what is actually reasonable, and though some things may not seem reasonable to us, we may, we are meant to do them either way. And if you if you care about someone, you don't want to see them sad and unhappy. So because I care about my parents, I sure I make them happy by doing what they want what they want me to do. Okay, and Winston? Um for me, I'll say um I remember when from 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 when we are gr we were growing up, um I remember there's this verse this this verse, Ephesians six verse one, that says, Children, honor your father and mother but this is the first commandment with the, with the promise. So I'd say actually what I think is I'd obey whatever my, my mom or dad tells me to do because actually I think that's what they think is right for me to do. And probably um, they won't lead me to do something that's not right. So I'll actually follow whatever they're telling me to do. Thank you so much. And a lot of you guys are saying, we're referring back to the law that was featured in the commandments. But also what Silas said, even though things may not make sense when God calls us to do things, we must go. 
Now, obedience also offers this sense of consecration. The people who obey God actually seem to be higher performing, more intelligent, more aware, and actually better than those who disobey him. And in this story, it is the very truth. Andrew, please take us through the key text today. What does it say? The key text comes from Daniel chapter 1, verse 20, and it says, In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his old in his old kingdom. Thank you so much. Now, who are we talking about when he said he found them? We really want to dive into the story. Silas, please tell us. Take us through the story. Give us a summary of what this is about. Okay, the story is about uh, the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, Jerusalem and besieged it. The king ordered Ashpanes, the chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve, which shows that Nebuchadnezzar looked for the best out of the best. Yeah, and in this, he put Daniel, Mishael, Daniel, Mishael, Meshach, Azaria, and Abednego to, to be his servants. And they were changed their names. Daniel's name was changed to Belteshazzar, Ananiah was changed to Shadrach, and Mishael was changed to Meshach. Azariah was changed to Abednego, which he made them, he gave them names of his kingdom so that they are from him. Yes. And Daniel decided to keep his name same as it was which we can see in the whole of the book of Daniel. And Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah didn't really make a stand firm about what their names was changed to because they didn't really see it as a great impact. So they were served food, the king's food, and the king's wine. And they chose not to defile themselves with this food and they requested the Ashpanes to give them a test for 10 days and let them eat fruits and vegetables and water and, and live the life they lived as Hebrews. And at the end of the 10 days, they were healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So they got to away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and give them vegetables instead. So they decided that they'll stand with their principles and do it the way they would do it even with God in the same room. Yes, thank you so much for reading this. And the first thing you mentioned was about the names. And names often symbolize identity. It gives understanding of who they are, where they come from. So I'm sure Daniel had a name, had a meaning to his name as well, way before now Nebuchadnezzar is changing it. My question to you is, yes, their name was changed, but was their purpose, was their allegiance modified as well? Winston? Um, for me, I think when the names were changed, um, personally, Daniel and his friends knew their purpose and they knew their desires. So actually, the fact that their names were changed by Nebuchadnezzar, um, I think they remained, they remained bold with their circumstances and didn't allow the fact that their names were changed to defile their nature. Yeah. Yes, Andrew, what do you think? I 
think that Daniel and his friends were obeying what God told them to do and they were following the paths of God and also they didn't do whatever they were told to to do by those by those uh, uh, angry people and and yeah yes absolutely so we really have to understand perhaps there's a different two types of identities that we can see today in our lives the identity that we hold outwardly so hello my name is sabira hello your name is winston but now god is really searching for the identity of our heart so the identity of our heart needs to be characterized by an obedience spirit now the did you know section really takes us through these names what they mean can you please walk us through this winston um, so, in the Did You Know section of uh, today's lesson, um, the names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were given to Daniel's friends. It's true. They even gave Daniel the name Be Belteshazzar. This was done by the Babylonians in an attempt to integrate those young men into the Babylonian society. While they were prisoners, they were not slaves. They were taken from the royal Israelite families in order to help govern those lands conquered by the Babylonians. This was a common practice in antiquity. By the food they were given, it is seen that they were treated even better than, the, than many Babylonians. This means that their step in faith to refuse the king's bounty was a very serious risk. Obviously, these were young men who were committed to their God and following what he had for them in their lives. Yes, okay. And like you said, there's a step of faith to obey, to refuse what the king told them to do. Can anyone tell us their own testimony, a moment of defiance of the world, defiance of the wicked deeds, but a choice to obey? Um. Actually, I'd say... For Daniel and his friends, it actually wasn't easy. Because, first of all, um, you know, in those days, actually going against the king, it wasn't something that was taken for granted. So I think the action of actually choosing to obey God and knowing where they came from and their culture and obeying God's promises that... They wouldn't spoil their bodies because actually they, they took their bodies as God's temple. So it actually wasn't easy for them. And I think that act of staying obedient, obedient despite the fact that you don't mind whatever is going to happen is actually something that we should emulate in our lives. It actually brings the point of consecration. Actually, when we should actually give our bodies wholly and fully dedicate our lives to God. Yeah. And also, not to be um, tempted by the earthly things, because actually we can't be partly gods and partly the earth. So we should actually dedicate fully to God. Yes, there is a rarity of defiance that these young men have that we should adopt today as well. And you've spoken about having our bodies as a temple of the Holy Spirit. Andrew or Silas, can you tell us how the influence of things we eat even to our body today can have. Uh, when you eat bad things that are bad for your bodies, it will, it will of course harm your, it will have, be, harm the effect of your health and it will, and it will it make you get sick and, and also, Many, it will do many things, many things to your body, and you might get some diseases if it depends on the kind of food that you eat. Yes, absolutely. And Silas? Okay, I think that what we eat is, is how we become. Like, when giving the example of a computer, yeah? Once you in give it data, it gives you back data, either either interpreted or 
However, you give it the data, it will give you output which is either easier to handle or more difficult. So when you eat something, it brings output in your effectiveness to your daily duties or your health at the end of the day. So basically what you eat de decides how your life is going to look like at a certain point. Yes. Absolutely. So we see the physical change and the physical effects of what we eat. But I'll also say, and Ellen G. White really alludes to this in Steps to Christ, that there's also a spiritual economy. What we feed our souls through the word of God, things we see with all our senses, the taste, the touch, everything that we interact with really influences us and has a spiritual effect. So now our spiritual economy, in the same way, we need to think about what we consume. And once we think about what we consume, if we consume, our, consume the right things, we can ensure true spiritual nourishment. Now, Andrew, please take us through the flashlight because I think it really gives us a clear understanding of what these men came to do. So the children of Israel were carried captive in Babylon and, and, and they were and they were served in and they were and they suffered in Babylon because they were everyone there was being selfish to them and and so they just trusted and prayed to God and and God answered their prayers and also God they honored God so So, but those bad people, they got what they de deserve, which God punished them because they, those bad people made God's people suffer. So those people really suffered. The people, the, those, the idolaters, the guys who, ma who made the, the other people suffer. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and she really says here that they were to be his representatives. I really want to talk about being ambassadors. What do you mean, what does it mean to you to be an ambassador of Christ? Let's maybe start with Winston. Um, I think when it comes to being an ambassador in Christ is actually we should manifest, we should manifest Christ. Actually, when someone sees me, um, I should em emulate the image of Christ um, through my character, my behaviors, and everything. So, like, when I'm actually doing something, someone might say, um, this guy, you know, he's like this and like this and not like this and like this. And actually, my character should actually show Christ. Yeah, in the same way Christ came and through him, we saw the character of God, same way as us is the way we should be seen, yeah. Silas? Okay, I think being an ambassador of Christ means you're pre representing him in every step you take. When you walk into a room, you represent Christ in the room you walk into. So when you walk into a room, however you take your actions, everyone is watching, believing that Christ is here and you are Christ, and what you're doing is what Christ would do. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it also talks about how being an ambassador of Christ does not entail this idea of compromise. We cannot compromise the identity. We can't uh, co compromise our goal, our mission, even in prosperity and adversity. My question is, did you think... Do you think that Daniel and his friends really knew that they would achieve so much? They would pass with flying colors with their diet. Go ahead. Um, no, like, the, like they didn't go 
pass their diet and yeah. Yeah, okay. Do you think they would succeed? Do you think they would predict sort of this success rate with their diet? Okay. If depending on what you eat, it's it's either makes you brighter or dumber. Not necessarily that some people eat things that make them dumb, but what you eat determines how fast you can think or how fast you can move. Yeah, and even though we eat the best we can, yeah, and everything has side effects, but we need to minimize the side effects we get. Yeah, and you can't do that without Christ. Yeah. Hey, Winston. Um, actually, from what I actually said before, that our bodies are the temples of God. And as you say that um, whatever we put in our bodies um, actually determines the kind of spiritual nourishment we get. And I actually think what Daniel and his friends did, um, they actually consider that their religion doesn't allow them to eat the food that they were being offered. And they actually stick to what God would have wanted them to do. So actually, for the expectation and what would have resulted after that, I think Daniel and his friends didn't care about whatever could have happened, so long as they are following what God wanted them to do. Yeah. Absolutely. And sometimes people look at SDAs. Why do we always follow a specific diet or like things that we're eating? But ultimately, it's for the betterment of our bodies. And the last thing you said there, it's really important to know as much as we focus so much as, oh, yes, this is the evidence to eat well, because being like Daniel will allow you to escape from exile and escape from the wrath of a king. But really, what Daniel and his friends were focusing on was obedience. Obedience is the good word. Obedience was something that they needed to prioritize. And the prioritization of, of obedience fell in line with the diet. So... I hope that we can bank our faith and bank our um, belief and honoring of God in assuring that, yes, the predictable outcome will be victory with Christ. Okay, so we are going to move to punchlines. There are wonderful verses here, and I'd love each and every one of us to select a verse that we think is most inspiring and speaks mostly to this story. Can we each give an example or a verse that we really like from these punchlines? Okay, I'll go first. Uh, I'd like to read Second John verse 6. It says, And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands, as you have heard from the beginning. His command is that you walk in love. Why do you think that verse is important? Because... God loves us. He wants the best for us. That's why he gives us commandments and statutes to follow so that we have the best of everything. Yes, Winston. Um, for me, I'll go with the first one, um, which is from Romans chapter 5, verse 19. And it says, For just as through the obedience of the one, Man, the many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Yes. Andrew, do you have a verse that you like particularly? Uh, yeah. I'll go with Second John, Second John chapter 6. And it says, And this is love that we that we walk in obedience to his commands as you have heard from the from the beginning his command is that you walk in love yes thank you and i think i'll just say the second verse and this is from romans chapter 16 verse 19. it says everyone has heard about your obedience so i rejoice because of you but i want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Okay, I think I'm really going to talk about this verse. Everyone has heard about your obedience. 
it's important to note that Daniel um, and his friends made a statement. They made a statement why they defied the king. And that statement was heard throughout the land, I'm sure. Now, are we willing as Christians to stand up and say, no, this is wrong. These people will, but I cannot. That takes a lot of courage. And we need to understand that obedience, regardless of the effects, and sometimes, not always, will we find ourselves being accepted in the society. But then equally, let us be in tune with our moral standing, that wisdom is gained by what is good. And equally, let us be innocent about what is evil. Can someone just please read the further insight? Um, okay, on the further insight, um, it says, let none who profess godliness regard, in the indif regard with indifference the health of the body and flatter themselves that interrupt intemperance is no sin and with no affect their spiritu spirituality. A close sympathy exists between the physical and the moral nature. Any habit which does not promote health degrades the higher and nobler faculties. Wrong habits of eating and drinking lead to errors in thought and action. Yes. Tell us what this means to you. Um, actually, from what I get, actually from the end, where it says that wrong habits of eating and drinking lead to errors in thought and action. Actually, I think this is something that most of us have defied because they think that actually what we eat and what we put in our bodies actually doesn't matter. But the real sense about this is actually what we eat and what we put in our bodies actually determines everything that we do. It determines how we think and even how we partake, whatever we do. Yeah, so I think this is actually something that we need to put into consideration and consider what you're eating and what you're drinking, actually. Yeah. Yes, and really, Ellen G. White in The Sanctified Life touches on the fact that our physical state reflects our spiritual and moral state as well. So let us be mindful as well of what we eat, what we drink, but equally as well, our moral compass, our moral nature, let that be kept in mind as we go on with our daily habits. Okay, I think we're going to go around and t really speak on what we have learned in this lesson. Um, certain lessons that really are profound and we are going to take home today. Can we start with Andrew? What is something that you have learned today? I've learned that we, we obey God and that we should obey if if you are given any instructions to do by God or, or our parents, we should obey it because uh, at the end of the day, we live a long life if we obey those instructions. Thank you. Silas? Okay, I'd just like to read this for our closing notes. It says, the strength that these young men were able to master came from a knowledge of God. They were not guessing that God might be faithful. No, they came into this trial knowing that God would honor his promises to them. How did they know this? And from this question, we can answer it as they had, they had a relationship with Christ. So they knew that Christ would come through for them in any situation as long as they ask for his help. Yes, and Winston did take us through the further insight. So as we close, I hope that we understand that obedience allows for consecration. Obedience is ultimately the fruit of faith. And in this way, as we obey God, defying the wickedness of this world, that we may grow closer and closer to him. Winston, can you please close us in prayer? Um, yes, sure. We're going to pray. Let's bow. Um, Almighty God, we come before you this wonderful day. Thank you for the gift of life. 
We thank you for our viewers at home and us for everything, for your graces and mercies, Lord. Thank you for protecting us and being with us since we started the lesson until this time that you have ended it, Lord. Father, may you continue being with us and may your grace be continue being seen in our lives, dear Lord. Be with us and help us understand whatever we have learned today and apply it in our lives. Be with us and continue guiding us and may will be done upon our lives. For it is in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Your obedience is not in vain. Thank you so much for watching.